a lot of slides to do today. <laughs> History of the devil, our last class for the season. The devil in more modern times. So we've got a lot of uh, 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 a lot of uh, uh, years to cover from the end of biblical times up to modern times. All right, first the Middle Ages. Surprisingly, Satan had a minimal role in medieval Christian theology. Although, if we look at medieval literature, we see Satan quite a bit. Satan was kind of a comic character in medieval literature. They made fun of Satan as a character. There was a book, The Golden Legend, by Jacobus de Bourgin in about 1260. It had a lot of stories of the saints, and always in these stories, Satan was kind of the, the butt of the joke. Satan was, was fooled by the cleverness of the saints and the power of God. Always uh, uh, duped by the saints' cleverness. i got to tell you some stories. They're, they're, these stories are not from the Golden Legend, but uh, the author of the history of the devil and the idea of evil repeat some of the stories from the Middle Ages. Well, i got to tell you a story first. It, it's not from this book. Apparently, there was a story that was circulating during the Middle Ages about a farmer that was preparing his field for planting, and the devil came to him and demanded uh, half of his crop when harvest time would come around. And the farmer was more clever than the devil, so the farmer said, well, which half do you want, the upper half or the lower half? And uh, the devil thought for a minute and was all confused, and the devil said, well, I, I guess I'll take the upper half. So the farmer planted turnips and left the devil with just the turnip house. <laughs> well, the next year the devil came to the farmer and same question, well, wh which half do you want? So the devil said, ah, I'll win this time. I'll take the lower half. So the farmer planted wheat and left the devil with just the stalks. <laughs> Another story. This is about, um, this is a German folk song from the Middle Ages. Uh, this is about a humorous song about a, about a German tailor, right? Um, the song starts out, A tailor went to wander on Monday in the morn, and there he met the devil, his clothes and shoes all torn. Hey, tailor, follow me. In hell the boys need thee, for thou must clothe the, de clothe the devils, whatever the cost may be. Now, the tailor on arriving in hell uh, maltreated all the devil, all the devils with his tailor instruments and scissors and things, uh, and it, uh, in the attempt at, at dressing all of them, and all the devils swore that they were, would never again allow a tailor into hell, no matter what <laughs> sins. <laughs> <laughs> Another comical story uh, is told of Dunstan, abbot of Claston, later Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, well, he was busily engaged in the fabrication of, an, of a uh, communion cup. The devil suddenly appeared to him, but the saint was not afraid. He took the pincers out of the blacksmith's fire and seized the nose of Satan, who ran off with a howl, never again daring to molest him. The event is commemorated in an old rhyme. It goes, St. Dunstan, as the story goes, once pulled the devil by the nose with red-hot tongs which made him roar that he was heard three miles or more. <laughs> where, did that, where, where, where did that go? The story? Yes. The, 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 that, that, that's from an old, an old German folk song. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I heard when, when yeah. I yeah, but I, I just went I, mean, I can remember the day the days uh, about more than three days uh, and we went through going down and then and then and we and when we left and then we were gone. Yeah. <laughs> But toward the, toward the end of the Middle Ages, the fear of witchcraft began, began to take hold. Um, the, um, 
Pope John the 22nd in 1326 issued a proclamation uh, called um, uh, called uh, 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 above the above the highest watchtower um, a proclamation warning against witchcraft. By the 1430s, uh, witchcraft was started started to be seen by the church as a part of a vast conspiracy led by Satan. And this leads into one of the worst periods of the church's history, uh, the Inquisition. A humorous introduction to a very dark period in the church's history. So that was like you said, fourteen sixty something. Yeah. So when did the Salem witch trial? Wasn't like a hundred years later? Uh, in the sixteen hundreds. Yeah. So it just yeah. lasted. This it's long. lasted a long time. Oh. I'll get there eventually. Several slides to go before we get to the new world. Um, in eleven sixty three. Actually, a long time before. Before the 1400s, it started much earlier. It, it, it started uh, several hundred years before that. Si uh, 1163, Pope, Pope Alexander III. That's when the title Inquisitor was first used. If we go back even earlier, uh, the Inquisition first really got going under Pope Gregory the Ninth. In 1229, the Inquisition became an established church institution. This was the first time that Pope became the absolute ruler of the church. Even at this time, even bishops could be brought before the Inquisition. The Pope was such a strong ruler at that point under Gregory. Gregory appointed the Dominican order as papal inquisitors, and the Dominicans became so hated because of their role in the tortures of the Inquisition that people that some people came up with a new name, a corrupted name for the Dominicans, based on a play on words in Latin. They called the Dominicans. Dominique Canis, <laughs> Dogs of the Lord. Gregory the Ninth sent Conrad of Marburg to Germany with uh, basically unlimited power to round up people suspected of being witches and put to put them to death. Conrad thought of the Pope as the vicar of Christ on earth, and he, he took his job very seriously. Even demands from three archbishops in Germany failed to stop the slaughter perpetrated by Conrad. I'll read a letter that one of the archbishops, a portion of one of the letters that one of the archbishops wrote to the Pope to try to get this to stop. Archbishop of Mainz wrote in part about what Conrad was doing. Whoever fell into his hands had only the choice between a ready confession for the sake of saving his life and a denial whereupon he was speedily burnt. Every false witness was accepted but no just, just defense granted, not even to people of prominence. The person arraigned had to confess that he was a heretic, that he had touched a toad, that he had kissed a pale man or some monster. Many Catholics suffered themselves to be burnt innocently rather than confess to such vicious crimes of which they knew they were not guilty. The weak ones, in order to save their lives, lied about themselves and other people, especially about such prominent ones whose names were suggested to them by Conrad. Thus brothers accused their brothers, wives their husbands, servants their masters. Many gave money to the clergy for good advice as to how to protect themselves, 
and the greatest confusion originated. <coughs> the Archbishop's letter failed to impress His Holiness and did not in the least change the course of things. Temporary setback to the Inquisition in Germany. July 30th, uh, 1233, a group of German noblemen set out on the road after Conrad. They caught up to him and killed him. It was just a temporary setback. A terrible book was written and duplicated, copied, of course, by hand at this time. There wasn't a printing press yet. The Witch Hammer. Malleus Maleficarum in Latin. It was not signed. There was no author uh, printed on it. But it is suspected that one, one of the German Dominican inquisitors, Heinrich Kramer or Jacob Springer, we don't know which one, I haven't been able to determine. One of my sources says it was Kramer. Another one says, it, says that the the style of writing in that document uh, is like other writings from Springer, so I don't know. Um, this, uh, this basically was an instruction book for inquisitors. This came out after these two inquisitors were having a rough time in Germany because the local authorities refused to cooperate with them. So they appealed to Pope Innocent VIII in 1484. The Pope came out with um, a proclamation to the German authorities uh, called um, desiring uh, the highest, with highest ardor. This proclamation said it is the highest um, desire of the Catholic Church for the German secular authorities to cooperate with the church's inquisition. Now, it didn't mean much. You notice, notice from the date that we're getting close to the Reformation. The German secular authorities didn't care much for what Rome said at this point. Okay, so they, this a proclamation didn't do any good. They still refused to cooperate. So, these uh, inquisitors, Dominican inquisitors, one of them, or maybe both of them, came out with this instruction book for inquisitors. According to Paul Karras, the author of this book, the style is poor, ideas are foolish, nonsense, self-contradictory, irrational, and superstitious. <laughs> Tell us what you really think, Paul. <laughs> um, he has a lot to say about this book. It was a, it was a, it was a horrible uh, piece of writing. As I said, it was an in, in, advice to inquisitors. Some of the advice is as follows. How to deceive the victim to extract a confession. <laughs> Lie to the victim. Uh, offer clemency in, in exchange for a confession. You don't have to go through with it, but offer a deal. If you feel bad about that, offer the deal anyway and then leave and bring in somebody else who didn't promise a deal to pass judgment. Mm -hmm. okay. Things like that. There's a big section of the book with very mm -hmm. detailed descriptions of methods of torture to extract confessions. I uh, think that's where uh, uh, body washing, what do we call it? Waterboarding. 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 Yeah. Interesting you mentioned waterboarding. <laughs> um, you've heard, you may have heard of the one trial to determine whether somebody is a witch is to throw them into water, and if the person sinks and drowns, they were innocent, and if they float, and if they float and survive, they're a witch, and you have to kill them. Execute them, right? Otherwise, whatever way they lose. Yes, yes. That's from this book. Quote 
the water refused to receive in its depths those who had shaken off the baptismal water through a renunciation of their faith. Quote from that book. But what did the Catholics hope to gain by killing the people? <laughs> I mean, what's the goal? The goal is wow. is to is to is yeah power. It's it, it, it the the on the surface it was to eliminate eliminate witchcraft and everyone who disagreed with the church. Every, it uh, just to wipe out all opposition and disagreement with the church. Are you familiar with kind of the? backlash to the framing of the Inquisition that's kind of gaining some steam here lately. Um, there are historians who are now saying that 90% of what we know about the Inquisition is made up or trumped up. Uh, oh, 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 is that right? Yeah, so I mean, you know, I don't know where where to set the, the, the thing, but, but there are definitely, yeah, do a, do a Google on was the Inquisition so bad, and you'll, you'll get, you'll get. Yeah, maybe from the Holocaust deniers or something. Well, I mean, I, I think it's more serious than that. I think it's worth a look. Um, I, I think one of the arguments is that um, the vast number of people who were called in by an Inquisitor were basically given the equivalent of, you know, say 10 Hail Marys and sin no more. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. so I don't, but anyway, it's an interesting thing. Yeah, yeah. So they don't believe that anyone was burned at the stake? No, definitely not that. Oh. They just don't believe that it's at the scale yeah. that is yeah, talked about, say, in that book, that, yeah. that they say that's not true. And, it, and it's not a question of believe, it's a question of these historians are saying there is evidence to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, didn't I'm, happen that now, way. Now, I'm not using this as a single source. No, I understand. Right? Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. A comical note to end the section on the Inquisition, but this is a true story. Well, it's a true story according to this book. It is funny, anyway. In Basel, Switzerland, in 1474, a diabolical rooster was so presumptuous as to lay an egg. The poor creature was solemnly tried, found to be possessed by the devil, and condemned to die by the order of the, the authorities of the good city of Basel. <laughs> Two thoughts. Even in those days, it was not good to be a trans. <laughs> At least I hope they got a winner winner chicken dinner. <laughs> Now we come to the Reformation. The devil was to Martin Luther a real living power. I've reproduced here the third verse from A Mighty Fortress. Though devils all the world should fill, all eager to devour us, we tremble not, we fear no ill, they shall not overpower us. The world's prince may still scowl fierce as he will. He can harm us none, he's judged, the deed is done. One little word can fell him. The world was filled with demons as far as Martin Luther was concerned. Another quote from Luther, this is from a book called Tishraden. That means table talk. We're all familiar with table talks, right? Yeah. Apparently, some of Martin Luther's students wrote down what Luther said at his at some of his table talks, and it's, that it, it became a book. So here's a quote. Early this morning, when I awoke, the fiend came and began disputing with me. Thou art a great sinner, said he. I replied, Canst not tell me something new, Satan? <laughs> That's sort of the essence of what it is to be a Lutheran, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. The, the uh, devil comes to us and tries to guilt us, you're a great sinner. And we, and we can say, because of God's grace, yes I am, but God <laughs> loves me anyway. What else you got? Um, 
the, the author of this book takes a paragraph out, takes some time out from talking about the devil to talk a, just a few seconds about Martin Luther. Um, he must be impressed with, maybe he's a Lutheran, I don't know, was a Lutheran, this book was written a long time ago. A little bit about Martin Luther's Christology. Um, Christ is the savior of humankind, but also everyone should be able to say, he has come to save me individually and personally. According to Luther, according to Paris, the most dangerous idols, the pulpit and the altar, let me explain what he means by that. There is no salvation in rituals or ceremonies in and of themselves. Sola gratia, sola fide, sola scriptura. Uh, grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone. The church and all of its rituals and ceremonies exist to assist us and support us with these solas. Grace, faith, and scripture. That's the reason for uh, all of our rituals and ceremonies uh, of the church. Uh, any questions up till now? Comments? Um, I've been reading like these old sermons of Martin, uh, Martin Luther. Oh yeah. I mean they're old. Yeah. Right? So, uh -huh. and every, he takes every opportunity to call the Pope the devil, yes. the dog. Yeah. I mean, some of the words that he uses is yes. just eye popping. Yes. He, and then he just loathes the man, whoever yes. the Pope is. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. He goes a little bit too far in, in some of his language, but oh, he yes. is passionate in his loathing of anything Pope. And yes, yeah. yeah, that's right, that's right. He uh, he considered the Pope to be the, the de devil incarnate, right. yes. With Luther, it, it makes a big difference as to the point the year you're looking at too because right, yeah, right. the later he yeah. got the you more. know the worse he got I, mean, yeah. I think this must be the later version it, it could well be I mean he wasn't great when he was earlier too when he was talking about the Pope but he really <laughs> dialed it up yeah. Plus, yeah. Yeah. Plus, he's any anti yeah. yes the yeah. older he got the yeah. more anti-semitic he got as well I mean in his later years he published a paper called um, on the Jews and their lies it was really, he really got terrible in his later years. So Hitler liked that book, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. He, used that. He, he, he used that in, in some of that in his propaganda. Yeah, yeah true. And, and Luther went on a pilgrimage to Rome and he saw how corrupt it was. Yeah, personally. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, right. The early modern period, now I'm going to stretch the conventional definition of the early modern period a little bit. Most, uh, most uh, uh, scholars start the early modern period actually before the Reformation in the late 1400s, but I wanted to uh, talk about the Reformation separately, so I'm going to start the early modern period in the late 1500s, about 100 years later. Now we have both Protestants and Catholics. And both of them believed that witchcraft was real, for at least for a time. Okay. John Way, early 1500s, uh, uh, wrote a paper, wrote a publication called uh, "The Tricks of the Devil." Um, Latin isn't so hard. You know, you, what? Anybody know what prestidigitation means? It's <laughs> like Magic trick, right? Magic trick. Magic trick. <laughs> On the tricks of the devil, right? So you know Latin, you just don't know that you know Latin, right? <laughs> this is where we get the word prestidigitation. Tricks. In that publication, he says, witchcraft does not exist, but Satan promotes the belief in it to lead Christians astray. <laughs> That's an interesting point of view, isn't it? The panic over witchcraft, now we're getting close to the uh, Salem witch trials here, right? The panic over witchcraft intensified in the 1620s. It continued until the end of the 1600s. 
There are estimates that around 60,000 people were executed for witchcraft during the hysteria. This just, this, not just in the 1600s, but you know, you go back all the way from Pope Gregory the Ninth uh, in the 1200s up through the 1600s and uh, estimates that are around 60,000 people. Now that's not from this book, that's from another source. Like I said, I'm not using just one source here. That's from another source. The Devil in the New World. Okay, so here's the, here we get to the um, colonies in Massachusetts, particularly the Massachusetts Bay Colony, um, which is with the, was the second colony in Massachusetts. The first one was Plymouth Colony, second is Massachusetts Bay. The New England Puritans believed in Satan's reign. John Winthrop, the, uh, the leader of the uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony, he wrote that the devil caused rebellious women to give birth to stillborn monsters, on each foot three claws like a young fowl. Uh, this is in particular rebellious women. He was rewarning, uh, warning women, stay in your place or look what will happen to you. Cotton Mather wrote, devils swarmed around Puritan settlements like the frogs of Egypt. The Puritans believed that Native Americans were worshippers of Satan. I, I, I can't say all of them did, but there, there was the belief at the time that Native Americans were worshippers of Satan. They described them as children of the devil, and some even claimed to have seen Satan appear in the flesh at Native American ceremonies. So this gave them the righteousness to attack the Indians and take away their land by... Yes, they were, yes, that. yes. Or forcibly Christianize them to save their souls. The boarding. Um, yes. That happened a lot in some of the indigenous communities, especially in Alaska. It did. With the natives. It did. It did. Well, you don't want to let those savages go to hell, right? <laughs> That's what they thought. That's what they thought. Well, they did that Hawaii, too. Yeah, yeah. The sure. The Hawaiians living there. Absolutely, absolutely. Manifest destiny and all of that nonsense. Uh, moving to the 1700s, the First Great Awakening, there were um, Christian revival movements uh, in the 1700s and 1800s. Uh, the uh, series of Christian revivals promoting renewed piety. Uh, during the First Great Awakening, uh, so-called New Light preachers portrayed their old light critics as ministers of Satan. There was a second great awakening in the early 1800s. Now, in the second great awakening, Satan took on sort of a new role. Here, Satan's primary role was seen as the opponent of the evangelical movement itself. And... This is a role he has largely retained among present-day American fundamentalists. Up to the modern era, <clears throat> belief in Satan remains strong in the United States, not so much in other countries. Example, 2013 poll by YouGov, do you believe in a literal devil? In the U.S., 57% yes. In the U.K., 18% yes. That was before Boris Johnson, so... <laughs> 51% of Americans believe that Satan has the power to possess people. 
The Exorcist. Yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> The Exorcist. Uh, in fact, I read, I don't have it uh, up here on a slide, but I did read in one of my books that um, uh, some uh, researchers uh, expressed the opinion that um, American people sort of mix what they have learned about Satan from church with what they have seen in movies and the media, mm -hmm. right? So yes, the movie The Exorcist plays a part in what Americans think about Satan. Now, these uh, statistics probably reflect to a certain extent the uh, popularity of uh, fundamentalism and evangelicalism in the United States uh, as opposed to uh, Britain. Um, the Encyclopedia Britannica has an interesting comment. Liberal Christianity tends to view Satan as a mythological attempt to express the reality and extent of evil in the universe existing outside and apart from humanity, but profoundly influencing the human sphere. <clears throat> All right, coming up to modern times, uh, I want to say a few words about modern Satanism. Um, especially since it has seemed to me, speaking with uh, a modern day fundamentalist that I have spoken had occasion to speak with, they seem to be quite terrified about the influence of the devil in, in our lives, um, and, and Satanism in particular. So I want to say a, a few words about this. I think, I think Satan is, uh, Satanists are a bunch of fools. Actually, I don't think there's much to be afraid of, but so here's my take on it. There are two, two types of Satanism, theistic Satanism and atheistic Satanism. Theistic Satanism are the people who worship Satan as a real entity, as, as a deity, as a god. Uh, for, fortunately, these people seem to be few and far between, and they are not well organized. Uh, uh, people who maybe connect with each other on the internet and find things about Satanism on the internet and uh, worship Satan either privately or in small groups online and such things. Uh, the organized groups that I've been able to find information on are examples of atheistic Satanism. Uh, these people are atheists. They don't believe in an actual uh, deity, Satan. Uh, they're atheists. They don't believe in any god at all. Um, the first example is called the Church of Satan. This is an organized group. It was started by uh, Anton LaVey in 1966. This guy was quite a character. He's dead. He's been dead now for several years. But um, there is a um, there is a living. Uh, current high priest of the Church of Satan. I think his name is Peter Gilmore, Peter H. Gilmore. But anyway, Anton LaVey was quite a character. I mean, he used to dress as what he saw, thought Satan looked like. He had a pointy goatee and, you know, with a really strange character. Uh, so the, this uh, Church of Satan has some principles. Anton LaVey even wrote a book called The Satanic Bible in the late 60s. <clears throat> Their principles are things like any religion. Of course, they're against all religion, mainly because it interferes with um, their philosophy of if it feels good, do it. They're hedonists. Libertarianism, hedonism, let the strong prevail. Uh, LaVey even made comments in favor of historical eugenics movements. Mm. Uh, uh, if let the, it, It's a mistake to coddle the weak because it hurts the human bloodline and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, even though they don't worship Satan as a real being, I'll have to say if Satan does exist, he must be very pleased with how, what these people believe and how they behave. It's not a group that you want to get yourself involved with. 
Another group uh, called the Satanic Temple is even more recent than Levian Satanism. This one was founded by Lucian Greaves and Malcolm Jerry in 2013. They are also anti-religion, but for a completely different reason. They're against all of the abuses of organized religion, in particular the um, abuse scandals in the Catholic Church that happened a few years ago. So they think that organized religion is a terrible thing. Um, but these people recognize human altruism and community. Um, They're anti-religion because of the abuses by religion, but they throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right? Um, and they go overboard many times. For example, they are against the Mormons allegedly baptizing deceased mm -hmm. Jews, right? You know, uh, the story is that Mormons baptized deceased Jews to try to keep them from going to hell, right? And so there was one case that the Satanic Temple people uh, put on a demonstration against this practice by going to the grave of a, of, a, of, a, of a Mormon woman and doing a ritual to supposedly change the gender identity of this deceased Mormon woman. I, I assume they were trying to be, make a point with some amount of humor, but it, you know, it was in very poor taste, and in fact, the demonstration included some nudity, and the, the, the head of the Satanic Temple got arrested for public indecency. So it's, again, not an organization that you want to get yourself involved. So, that's modern Satanism, at least to the two uh, organized uh, incarna incarnations of it that I have been able to find. Um, so, that's uh, the history of the devil. In this series, we've gone from pre-civilization, ev evil worship, through bi biblical, biblical times up until the present. Um, just to put a plug for classes in the fall, September 10th is our education kickoff Sunday at Ministry Fair. On September 17th, those are the first classes in the fall for all ages. Go in peace, serve the Lord, and thanks for showing up. Yes, all right. Of course, you know, yes. Trump means he's been in a witch hunt. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Trump is Trump has been the subject of a witch hunt. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, Joe McCarthy. Um, oh yeah, yeah, that was talk about evil. Yes, yeah, yeah, the communist witch hunt. Yeah. Yes. I would throw in one more modern version of Satanism. Yeah. And that's kind of casual protest. So, like, you go to. Uh, ACDC rock concerts and they sell devil's horns <laughs> that light up. You know, you know. <laughs> and um, it seems to me that it's very much positioned to just be kind of countercultural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they use very much imagery and they, some of their, that particular band songs and other bands. Yeah have satanic illusions without saying go and worship Satan or yeah. join our cult or church or yeah. whatever. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, these, uh, um, uh, these uh, atheistic Satanist groups, I mean, the real reason they use Satan is for shock value, yeah. right? Right. 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 Uh, they, they don't worship Satan. Uh, they're... They're, they're, they're anti-religion, and the only reason they use the word Satan is because it's shocking to use the word Satan. Right. That's the real reason. Makes me think of the Rolling Stones and sympathy for the devil. Yeah. <laughs> How do you classify, like in the 30s and 40s, the gentleman who made a big rise in Germany, Hitler? Yeah. I've, I've heard of him, you know, as being the Satan personified type way he did things and what his actions were. Yeah. Is that, in, in 
in any of your readings? Do they even refer to him? No, I haven't. I haven't run into Hitler in any, any of the readings. Uh, I, I, I. Of course, that's more modern day, based on yeah. the timeline that you're dealing with. Right. No, I, I have not. I didn't run into Hitler specifically in, in any of the readings about the devil. Uh, maybe that is more um, a secular thing in the view of the authors that I've read. There's the Duke Blue Devil. <laughs> <laughs> a Catholic school. <laughs> How about or, the no, I'm thinking of DePaul, right? DePaul, DePaul is also the, the yeah. <laughs> How about the Waco, Texas? Happening. Oh, the Grand, Grand, Grand Grand Davidians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll have to confess I don't know much about them. I mean, my understanding is that they would consider themselves the antithesis of Satanism. It's just us who look at them and see evil, and therefore make an association. Yeah, right. Well, it seems like Satan is being used for pulling and pulling, right, to make people believe or make people not believe. Mm. It's almost being used as an instrument that the people use as an instrument to get mm -hmm. what they want. With yeah. the Inquisition, the, the witch trials, mm. but you know, God doesn't work that way. <laughs> so, you know, there's this lovely story that I read. It's a true story. So this missionary sent to this, um, like an aborigine into the, into the Amazon forest, Mm. and to, um, to do missionary work, to convert them. So he goes, and he's carrying around his Bible, and he goes to the villages and preaches every single day, and no conversion. And so he does this for a long, long time. And then he goes into his hut, disappointed, and he vents to God and says, Why did you send me here? I have accomplished nothing. I've converted no one. Then the villagers, you know, a few days after this, notice something weird. And he, they noticed that this priest didn't come around anymore. This priest used to come every single day without fail. And so they said, well, he'll probably come tomorrow. So they waited. He didn't come. So they waited some more days. He didn't come. So they said, we better go find him and see what happened to him. So they found his hut. They went in and found him dead, clutching this Bible still in his hand. So the villagers said, what is this book that he's always carrying around? So they picked up the book, which was just, you know, dog-eared and tattered. They took the book back to their village, buried the priest. Fast forward 20 years, more missionaries come. And they say, we have come to preach the gospel to you so that you believe in our Lord Jesus Christ. And the villagers said, stop right there. We're already converted. <laughs> and so the missionary said, how did this happen? And they said they told him about the book, they read the book for themselves, and then they showed him where the priest was buried. So it's just like the way that God works, it's not, you know, like in your face, but it's like God always finds this way to work around us to get what he wants done. Sometimes it's through people, but most of the time it's not. He'll, if he has to like bypass us, work around us, mm -hmm. he will. Mm -hmm. But you know, I love this story because you know this priest died thinking that he had done nothing, mm -hmm. and yet it's kind of like when we plant a little seed and we're not here to yeah. see it fully mature and grow, doesn't mean that it because we don't see it that it doesn't happen, but it happens. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you all. Thank you.